Spirit of Aviation Week. Coming up on Stream 1 at 4 o'clock, it's from the EIA archives, The Stealth Revealed, looking back at the F-117A's first appearance in Oshkosh in 1990. On Stream 3 at 4.15, Warbirds in Review takes center stage, featuring the story of the restoration of the P-51C Mustang, Lopes Hope. And at 4.30, on Stream 2, U.S. Air Force Captain Kristen Wolf discusses flying and commanding the F-35 Lightning Demonstration Squadron. For a complete schedule of events, visit eiatogether.org and also check out the additional presentations and specials hosted by our virtual exhibitors. Remember, all of our presentations are also available on demand. Hi everyone and welcome back to the live workshops here at EA Together. My name is Mark Force. And I'm Joe Norris. And today, this session, we're going to be talking about woodworking and wood construction for aircraft. It's truly one of the first original methods of building an airplane, going back to the Wright brothers. Well, even beyond that, I mean, even when they were still working with gliders yeah. and, and everything, you know, up up through the early powered aircraft, everything was basically wood and fabric. So, so yeah, and, and of course, wood, a very natural material to start things out. I mean, they didn't have composites. They didn't have developed aluminums and other specialty alloys that we do today. With, and with of course, aircraft. wood was plentiful because there was trees everywhere, everywhere back then. Yeah, so. exactly. So um, we're going to talk a bit about wood construction, about some of the techniques you'll do, and we're actually going to be building a wooden rib which will simulate pretty much all the techniques that you would build a wooden aircraft or restore a wooden aircraft. So uh, let's talk about building aircraft in general, Joe. Mm -hmm. Everything has kind of shifted more towards sheet metal, it seems like. Uh, it, sheet metal is a bit quicker, actually a lot quicker. Uh, the materials uh, from the kit manufacturer are already done, so there's less work involved. Right, it lends itself a lot to their computer-aided, uh, you know, construction techniques too for cutting parts and, and right. duplicating parts and all that kind of stuff. I mean, wood is much more of a hands-on individual you know, parts making process so it's not it doesn't lend itself quite so much to the modern day what we call an aircraft kit of yeah today. exactly so the, the, the kits have been getting away from that there's still some classic kits and some uh, kits are available uh, to build a wooden uh, or uh, uh, primarily wood aircraft it's sometimes right. it's a hybrid between wood and steel tube fuselage right yeah a, a lot of your um, designs uh, started out like in the 30s uh, even early uh, late 20s and early 30s and then through that golden age of aviation you'll find a lot of those biplanes and a lot of the early monoplanes were were steel tube construction for the fuselage but the wings and tail were all wood construction just like we're going to do today yeah and actually uh, kind of a side note to, to wood construction is wood was kind of the forerunner of composite aircraft. The KR series was a hybrid of wood and styrofoam and fiberglass. Some of the early Rutan designs were actually made of wood, like the Very Vigan. Yeah, Very Vigan had a lot of wood construction in it, absolutely. Yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the progression from the all wood construction uh, to that com uh, combined wood and composite. And then, of course, uh, especially Rutan went all the way into the uh, first the moldless composite, and now, of course, all the very high technology molded composites that they do today. Yeah, so, so in many respects, it was kind of a proving ground to the more of the advanced stuff. So very much a, a stepping stone from the old school technology to right. some of the advanced stuff that we're doing today. Right, exactly. And and while it's true that you don't get uh, the real um, sophisticated kits like you do in some of the metal aircraft. Uh, the upside of wood can be the fact that it is really the least expensive material yeah. to build an aircraft out of, and it is the least demanding as far as specialty tools goes. Yes. So if you're really looking to build on a budget, you're looking to really keep your cost to, to a really, really low rate compared to a lot of other kits, the wood aircraft are still very, very uh, appealing in that regard. Well, that's true. And some of the things they're doing now, in fact, some of the things that we incorporate in our little project with laser cutting of wood. So there are some laser cut parts made of plywood and other materials. So they have been using some of that newer technology and bring it into the wood aircraft. Right, very uh, very much so. Yeah, the la the laser technology as far as like you say cutting out parts has really really been, uh, you know, across the board in in the aircraft industry where it's metal or composite or wood or whatever. It's that really is has really a leap ahead as far as the ability to make some of these parts. Yeah. So when when I think of a wood airplane, I think of something that is uh, an organic thing. It's going to it's going to uh, essentially for lack of a better word, rot away. But that's not really the case because we see a lot of aircraft that were built in the 20s and 30s still surviving till today. So what what makes that better or what, what makes wood aircraft survive 
over a long it really of time. it really is about, about how you treat the wood after you do the initial construction for example uh, here at EAA many of you might have been here and seen our travel air that yeah. we give rides at Pioneer Airport yeah, right we just this over this last winter we uh, took the fabric off of the wings the lower wings and and you know did new fabric and we found a lot of that construction in there is the original you know 19 29 construction yeah and it's is just as good today as the day they did it because really? they treated it they properly. treated it yeah you know you use your proper varnishes and, and make sure everything's sealed up so you don't get moisture impregnation in there and, and get uh, you know possible insect infestation all have you if you seal that wood up properly with the proper coatings it literally will last I mean it's a memory item it doesn't you can't you know, if you bend it like metal you can bend it to a certain amount and it'll stay bent yeah would it'll bend that same amount and flex back to I'm where back it was. They yeah. call it a memory item. Obviously, ah. you bend it too far and it'll break, but course, so, will, so yeah. will the metal. Right. But <laughs> but wood is very very uh, retentive of its original shape and it's very flexible. So a lot of your earlier uh, aerobatic airplanes, for example, were were wood because they had that flexibility, sure. that ability to stand those loads and return to its original shape. So it, it has it even even in modern aircraft today, it does have a place in certain applications. Yeah, and it, and it kind of transfers over. I mean, if you see like uh, you know when you're speaking of that I'm thinking like the Voyager aircraft and the wings how they flexed up yep. w uh, on an initial takeoff and yeah. even some of our modern airliners moving like that too. Right. so it's all it all kind of today I guess what I'm saying is all those kind of high-tech things still tie into this very low-tech and and, and uh, yeah, very original basic, construction. very basic yeah. original construction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It all goes back to those original aircraft that were designed and built out of wood, and then everything built on that, all the way up to all this super high tech stuff that we see today. A really big foundation to what we fly today. Exactly, there's no doubt about exactly. it. Exactly. Yep, that's true. So we'll talk a bit more about how we preserve wood a little mm -hmm. bit later on in the yep. program, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, you did mention that it is one of the lowest tech in terms of tools. We're just using basic woodworking tools. And in fact, uh, there's not a lot of workshops available. Uh, in fact, the EA Sport Air doesn't have a specific wood workshop. We do incorporate it with some other things mm -hmm. because what we found is people are so comfortable using these materials. They have literally, to some degree, have grown up using uh, tools and working with wood, uh, right. so they they just dive into your, it. Yeah, your your uh, junior high and high school carpentry classes. Yeah. Um, you know, doing projects in your own home. Uh, you know, working on furniture or cabinetry or something like that. It it really is the same techniques that you're using. Um, the parts are just a different size, really, is what it boils down to. Because yeah. I mean, you've got your same basic tools. You've got your saws, your clamps your hammers, yeah. uh, those types of things. And that's exactly the same type of thing that we're going to use here uh, building an aircraft part out yeah, of it. Yeah, it's very simple tools. I mean, very there's no, simple. no special tools, as you mentioned. Yeah. There might be some things that are kind of out of the box that you might use that will improve uh, how long it takes to do things. For example, like a, a, a drum sander or a, a circular sander so you can f fine tune the shapes right. and lengths uh, quicker, right? Power sanders are, you know, that's kind of the next step above the basic, basic hand tools. Yeah. And still, that's when you think about the broad spectrum of, of specialty tools. Uh, you know, that's something that you buy at your local hardware store. You know, a, a little belt sander or a yeah, little, a little belt sander, sander or something. Yeah. I mean, that's really simple stuff that can be had very inexpensively uh, from a local uh, supply house, and uh, you know, give you a, another, uh, you know, speed up that process just a little bit and make make things a little bit easier. Yeah, and that's another good point because you're not talking about massive machines. You're talking about smaller bench type or bench top type machines. Right, exactly. Uh, one of my favorite tools is the one inch belt sander. Yeah, uh, it, it's only about this big. I think when I bought it a few years ago, it was like $99 on yeah, sale. Right. And I use that for everything, all my wood projects, but everything else as well. It's a very versatile tool. Right. And one of the ones that I have not only has the one inch belt, but it also has a circular sanding pad built into it. So right. you get uh, right. multi-operations out of that. Yep, I have I have a, a larger version of that. It's, it's not the one inch wide, but it's a three inch wide belt, yeah. mm -hmm. and it has the disc sander on the side. So sure. you can do you know longer stuff on the belt sander, and then you can yeah. do your fine tuning of your shapes of that on the disc. And I mean, that was a handy thing that I bought uh, at one of these discount tool houses for probably $50. Yeah. You know I mean, it's just a real simple little yeah. tool. Yeah, those little tabletop tools aren't expensive. Another tool that works out really well 
especially when you're dealing with wood. So uh, with wood, we're dealing with uh, large wood pieces, but we're also dealing with sheets of wood, like plywood. Yep. Uh, and uh, it really helps to have a bandsaw sometimes, rather than, right. say, a jigsaw or something else to cut out those intricate shapes. Because yep. sometimes you're doing some, for example, like a nose rib here. This happens to be a, a laser cut nose rib. But if you are uh, creating this at home without the, you know, the facilities of having a laser in your right, shop, right. Uh, having a bandsaw to cut out these yep. uh, complex shapes. Yep, and then, and then finish it, it off with your belt sander. Yeah, exactly. Then, so you cut out, rough cut it yep. with the bandsaw, and then use, as you say, the belt sander to do the fine tuning. Yep. To Which all could shape. be done by hand, obviously, as well, but it just takes that much longer. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah you could do a sanding pad or yep. a file even. Yeah, exactly. To do it. But yeah, the belt sander, the a little, little drum sander, even a little Dremel tool just to get into that, uh, in that final little inner, inner curve there. That, that's an excellent point because that's another real handy tool for everything is yeah. the Dremel tool. Yeah. You get into those small little curves. No matter, no matter what aircraft you're building or what it's made out of, I'm sure you're going to find use for a Dremel tool yeah, sooner or later. It's one of, the handiest, one of the handiest tools you can buy at the local hardware store and use in your aircraft project. I, I still have mine from when I'm back in grade school. I do too. Got I've, got, I've got my original <laughs> Dremel. They last a long time. They're a great little tool. So not a lot of specialty tools. Basically. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, and, and the table shows us. I mean, we have, uh, and we'll get into a little more detail, but we have a tiny saw. We have some household, uh, actually school scissors. Scissors, yep. Uh, a staple gun uh, for temporarily fastening things. And right. We'll yep. get into this in a little bit in terms yeah. of what to use and how to use it properly. Yep. But beyond that, not a lot of other no. special tools. A no. hammer. Everyone's got to have yep. a hammer. Yeah, we got to have a hammer. <laughs> it, you don't really need a really big hammer in this case, but no, a hammer, no. any any normal household size hammer will work. Uh, maybe some clamps. Yeah, some clamps. And clamps today, uh, we're really at a benefit today of some of the technology. Now, not only do we just have like the old C clamps that you used to see in your old metal yeah, shops. Right. Years ago. Now we have the, the spring clamps, spring clamps yeah. and you've got the, the ones that are the bar clamps where you can slide them back sure. and forth and adjust the size and I mean there's uh, lots and again those are all available at your local uh, you know big big box supply store yeah. or your local hardware store has all of those things yeah. uh, right there in, in downtown you don't even, have, don't even have to order it. Exactly you know. and I've even seen people use clothespins for clamps. Yep and on a smaller and how, parts, how simple yeah. and how inexpensive can that be? Right exactly so. I mean it's just very very uh, that that is the real appeal of the wood aircraft is the fact that it really is for the person who's really on a, a, a low budget. You, know, yeah. you can build a heck of a nice, good performing aircraft for not a lot of dollars. And what I found, and this is kind of a, a side note, is when you're working with wood, because it's such an organic material, I mean, there's, there's a feel good feeling it about it. It smells good. It smells good. It feels good. good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, compared to like composites right. or sheet metal or some of the other uh, construction. Yeah, and the only thing you have to watch, you know, if you're doing it in your basement or in your house, the only thing you have to watch for is the dust yeah. when you're sanding or cutting. That's, that's really the only thing you have to kind of watch to, to clean up after exactly. yourself a little bit. Exactly. And if you check our Hints for Home Builders out, we've done a, a couple of different videos on dust collection and different techniques you can use with a simple shop vac to right. get rid of a lot of those things. Exactly. Uh, I did one a couple years ago where we have a dust collection table where you can sand and cut it and grind draws the dust and draws away. the dust in in a way and helps to minimize that. Exactly. Yep. Uh, I just did another one recently where we are uh, using a furnace filter and a fan drawing the air through the furnace filter. Sure. And that's going to clean your shop air. So those sort of things help to minimize that. And right. I mean, that's really the only downside. Yep. Is, you know, and exactly. it's, it's not a dangerous material at all. No, to use. Not, not at all. And not that's all. why you'll find, like, you know, coming to AirVenture and, and especially like a kid venture, you'll see a lot of the kids making wood ribs, ribs as their yep. first project because yep. it's simple, it's uh, easy. very non hazardous tools, yep. and it's easy to do. Yep. Yeah, a very good introduction into the world of aircraft building for yeah. sure. So the wood that we use, mm -hmm. uh, it's not the stuff that you buy at the hardware store. I mean, you can't just take a chunk of two by four <laughs> And cut it up. I mean, you could, you could, but that's under the rules. Yeah. Experimental, you can use anything you want to. Right. But in the in, in the world of safety, right, uh, it's not necessarily the, the best, best thing material. to do. No, no, no. Usually, what we're looking for is a, a wood that, uh, if if you go back to. Uh, uh, the old military specs. There's actually a, back when the military was still had wood aircraft. They actually yeah. had specs on the types of woods that they yeah, would there's use. There's like the MS specs. Yeah, and, and, yeah, but, like but the old mil spec wood. I mean, you can actually still find that spec 
um, you know, on the internet nowadays. Yeah, right, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it'll delineate the different types of wood that they felt were aircraft quality woods. And the primary one was, was spruce. Yes, um, okay. And we still use a lot of spruce today, although it's getting harder to get because spruce trees don't grow as fast as we can cut them down. So, well, yeah. Um, so because of that, uh, we've now found ways to substitute Douglas fir okay. and some mahoganies and even some ash. Uh, there are some places, depending on what the, the structure requires, strength-wise and, and stress-wise, there's a lot of different options you have there, but it's still, uh, you want to get those woods from a uh, specialty wood supplier because then you know you're going to get the quality and the grain structure and everything that you want, rather than just going down to a local uh, lumber yard and, and starting to cut up your two by four. Uh, you know, if you can get a mahogany two by four and it's got good grain, you can do that if you want, but yeah. you're probably just as easy to order your wood from one of the aircraft supply houses and get the wood that's already been graded and inspected for you. Yeah, and of course, Aircraft Spruce gets its name from initially providing. That was the first thing they sold. Yep, they first sold thing they sold was right? was the Aircraft Spruce wood. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> I've heard of actually because of like you say the scarcity of, of spruce that they're actually reclaiming lumber's from buildings that were built in the 20s and 30s because that wood was so, such pristine material. Yep. It was very inexpensive back then. And right. They used it and it was really good stuff. So oh, they're yeah. tearing those things down for redevelopments, they're reclaiming those spruce Yeah, materials. yeah, because it is it is very, 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 it's, it's, it's st strength to weight ratio is probably the best of any of the woods. Yeah. And so it was used for a lot of the primary structures and, and still is, is kind of the go-to wood that you'd want to use today if you want to build strong and light. Sure, so one of the things that, you know, I think of with wood is you see in wood, uh, pockets where there's, you know, sap or sap pitch, pockets, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, knots and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a wood tree is organic like that. There's always yep. going to be something. So right. you need to essentially grade it or from the supplier yeah. have them kind of pre-sorting Right, materials. and the other thing that, the, the, the other uh, uh, reference that we have that uh, every good home builder should have in their house is Advisory Circular 4313, yeah. which is the uh, Methods, Techniques, and Practices Advisory Circular, and that has a whole section on wood in it. Yeah. And it has some very nice pictures in there showing you what you need to look for uh, in terms of knots or, or grain structure sure. or pitch pockets and all that stuff, and, and how you can determine this the wood might be good for some, some parts and maybe not good for others depending on what that particular structure demands so yeah. you can grade your own wood after you get it uh from the uh, from the supply house yeah. or whatever. So uh, and, the, and the good news, like you said, is you can go to the FAA website and download that. And then yep. that that particular document is about it's pretty close to two. Yeah, six. it's it's giant. So you can download it as a PDF and then view it on your. And actually, on the website, you can download it by section too. Oh, so so yeah. you can actually download just the wood just, section yeah. if you want, or just the hardware section yeah. or whatever. Uh, and, and you know, just grab the parts you want because they're all separate Perfect. separate uh, yeah. chapters. So, so it I mean, out really, really well. easy references, but really important to have yeah. as far yeah. as your home building library are things like advisory circular 4313 right. and other things even the mill specs like you said yep. you can download mill specs those are those yep. too. mill specs are on the web uh, you got to search a little bit for some of the older ones but they're there it's the power of the internet <laughs> exactly exactly so we use spruce as one of the main materials correct uh, typically for the structure if we look at our, our wing rib here we have spruce for the the, the spark cap caps, strips yeah and then the, uh, the diagonals the and the diagonals uprights, yeah. that give it some structure. If yeah. you look at this, it's very much like a bridge. Yep, it's it's all triangulated, just yep. like any kind of a bridge type structure, yep. yep. So which makes it very strong right. and very lightweight. Correct. Yep. But besides that, we're using other materials, and mm -hmm. some of the other materials we're using uh, primarily are, are plywood. Right. So again, uh, specialty plywood. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, we're not using your standard home materials in that regard. Right, yeah, you'd use a marine type plywood which has uh, mo moisture proof uh, adhesives in the plywood. Yeah. And again, we're gonna seal those anyway, but just in case yeah. there might be a breach in the in the uh, the coating, it's, you know, because something got damaged or something, you want that adhesive to still stay sound if it would get wet or something. So yeah. you want to use a marine type plywood. Now, the interesting thing about plywood is when everybody thinks about plywood, you think about going down to your local hardware store and buying a, a piece of plywood that's, you know, three eighths of an inch thick or half inch thick or three quarters thick and it's five ply, maybe yeah. seven ply. Mm -hmm. When we're talking aircraft plywood, we can get down to, this is actually a piece of plywood here. And that's, I mean, there's three plies there and it's just, I mean, it's yeah, sixteenth of an inch thick. It's, it's amazing how, yeah. how thin. How thin they can cut that, how flexible it is. And, yeah. and if you look at the quality of this, you know, mm -hmm. you go to the hardware store and you've seen plywood. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, sometimes it, it's a little sketchy. Yeah, yeah, sometimes it's not quite as pretty as we'd but, like it to be. But what you look at the plywood that we use in aircraft construction, 
Ocean, mm -hmm. and uh, which is, and I think the reason why we use marine plywood mostly yeah. is because the volume of plywood is made for marine uses, but right. it transfers over in terms of the, the quality the air, and right. specifications we need for aircraft. Exactly. Use. But yeah. it's just beautiful. Yep. It's just amazing yeah, it's stuff. Just, I mean, it's, it's very clean, very it, straight. Yeah, it's great stuff. So we use specialty plywoods for that. So mm -hmm. here's a, a thin sheet of plywood. Okay, yep. and then we have other thicker pieces for contour shapes that yep. we wouldn't necessarily want to cut out of a larger piece. Right, and even that, I mean, that's only a quarter inch thick, Yeah. but that's five plies. So, I mean, those plies individually are pretty thin. Yeah. You, know, you slice them down and, and then, you know, put them together with the, you know, uh, on the bias yeah, and everything right, to exactly. give, it, give it the strength they want yeah. and still give it the lightness. I mean, that's, yeah. that hardly weighs anything. Yeah, there's nothing to this at all. And it, like you say, very strong, very, very stiff, stiff. Yep. very lightweight, yep. just screams airplane. Exactly. Basically. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. Great. So, so we use spruce, we use plywood. Uh, in terms of building a wood aircraft, there's some basic steps. One of them, of course, is once you get the raw stock, mm -hmm. you usually have to cut it to size. Right. Either trimming a larger piece, for, for example, for a spar, yep. or uh, cutting out these contour shapes. Right. There's some special things you have to watch out for, because wood has a grain. Right. Correct. Yep. So we have to watch out how we cut that, right? Right. Yep. So how how do we watch um, out for that? Again, you can. Uh, there's a lot of good guidance in AC 4313 about wood grain and and what what part you're making might call out what the grain you want. Do you want the sure. grain in line with the part? Do you want it cross grain? Do you want it on a diagonal? It all depends on what that particular part might call for. In terms of how it, it you know, how it interacts the loads interacts things, with yeah. the rest of the structure. Yeah, right. and that'll typically be called out in your plans. Okay. Because you're going to have a set of plans. Uh, and it's going to show you, okay, you need uh, the Alondrons are this, you know, one inch square, and they're this long, and yep. your uprights are this, you know, all these different sizes, and it'll it'll show you in there which way they want the grain running, and you know how where they want the joints, like because sometimes you might need to join a part, and there's specific ways that you need to do that. Again, called out in in 4313 and on your plans that you get from your. Uh, plans vendor. Sure. So uh, all of that stuff, you know, you can research that and find out exactly what you want to uh, do as yeah. far as picking the right piece of wood with the grain that you want and everything else yeah. to make sure that you've got that part that'll carry the load that it needs and, to load. And set the right way and everything. Exactly. Like so yeah. basically then we, we have our sheet, we lay it out as we yep. need to do it, and then we have to cut it. So Correct. as we mentioned before, we can use a bandsaw, yep. uh, worst comes to worst, a jigsaw, yep. or... You can use a little handsaw if it's smaller parts yeah. like that. Or yeah. even a router. Or even a router. I mean, yep. Router is kind of like a next step up. There's not everyone has a router. Handy. If, you've, if you've got one, they work out great for some yeah. of these things. Again, like cutting in the interior part of yeah. this, that could be done with a router as yeah, well. Sure. Um, so lots of different ways that you could use that. If you have a router, certainly not something you need to go out and buy just to no. do this. Right. If this is the only thing you're going to do. Yep. Um, so there's lots, lots of different things that you can do to, to lots of different ways to skin that cat, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut the parts out, and then we're going to get them ready to essentially assemble, right? Correct, yep. Yep, you want to make sure that, um, obviously, you want to get rid of any um, uh, long splinters. You want to make sure you don't have any crack. I mean, really inspect the part and make sure yeah. there's no cracks and no splinters, no long strips of wood that have been stripped out during your, your cutting process mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, I would take uh, and make sure that you don't have any, uh, any you know, little rough edges sticking up that you're going to run through your finger after you start ex assembling the part. Yeah. Um, so a little bit like deburring your metal, you can also just check the edges of your wood and make sure that there's not uh, uh, not anything that might catch you or maybe stick through the fabric after you because most of these wood aircraft are fabric covered yeah. a lot of them are anyway sure. so and then where you're going wherever you're going to put adhesive um, you're going to want to rough that wood up a little bit because a lot of the wood, especially spruce, is pretty tight green and it's very mm. smooth on the outside. Okay, so and the, that doesn't penetrate. Yeah, you need to get you need to get some purchase with your adhesive, whatever adhesive you might yeah. be using. So a lot of times, wherever you're going to put a, a, a structure together, you're going to want to go in there and just kind of rough that up with some sandpaper or something to give it a little texture so that it's got something for the some teeth, if you will, sure. to let that adhesive get bind bind yeah. with. So mm. that that's important, especially on the back side of your plot. I would, you know, Mark was showing here, you know, you were showing how nice and smooth and pretty this is. Yeah. Well, that's a, a very smooth structure there, and you really want to, uh, on the side that you're going to put your adhesive, you really want to take a, some little coarser sandpaper and break that up a little bit so that you've got some good coarse uh, material there to get, get a hold of. Get the, the yep. adhesive to get some uh, get some grip grip to it, exactly. mechanical bond to it. Exactly, yep, right. exactly. Right. So, so that's kind of your prep work there, um, is to make sure that on the areas that are going to get uh, adhesive, you want to make sure that they're roughed up a little bit 
it. You want to make sure that everything fits pretty good. Um, you know, like we're going to put uh, some parts in this jig here, and of course you're going to build a great big jig just like this for your fuselage sides or your or whatever. You know, and everything gets jigged up and measured and all that stuff. Well, that's a, a, another good important point with wood construction because mm -hmm. you're not necessarily building this shape freeform. No. And you have to get all these exactly the same. Exactly. Yep. So you need some sort of jig or fixture right. that you can essentially make replica parts. Yep. Which you also build with wood. With wood, right, exactly. <laughs> Typically, and, anyway. And make it really easy. Yep. So this is nice. This particular sample is typical of an aircraft wing rib. Correct. Okay? Yep. And what's nice about this is this particular wing rib is just the standard Hershey bar style. Wing. Yep, yeah, it'd so, be a constant cord wing like yep. a Cub or a Champ or exactly. something like that would have, or a lot of your early home builds. Which is great because you can you whip out 26 or 30 of these. Whatever you need out of one jig. Yeah. Now you see some of the more tapered uh, aerobatic aircraft yep. and some of the biplanes they use a wing uh, that is shaped to it. Right. And then you have a problem because now you have to make a jig for every single, every pair. Every pair. Yeah, yeah. you'll have one one in each wing that's going to be identical and the next yeah. one's going to be a little shorter and the next one's going to be a little shorter. So you do end up in some cases if the aircraft gets a little more complicated, you do end up building multiple jigs um, to, to do that. To accommodate those different yeah. sizes of ribs, so. So so the jig is important. It's very yep. it, yep. it's it is it is the Backbone of getting wood getting your it's, it's 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 really your your vehicle for repeatability. Yeah, you know. and like you said, not only for the wing ribs, but for the fuselage right. and other complex multi-piece parts. Correct. That yep. you're putting together, you're not just kind of winging it. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, manager. you need to make sure it all it all lines up because yeah. you want to you want the wings to fit on the fuselage when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So good practice would be to go out and buy a balsa wood airplane kit and put put it together and <laughs> practice a little bit. Yeah. Right. To get kind of a feel for how that goes together. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically we then we, we cut the parts, we trim yep. them, and yep. then we're fitting them up. Right. So one of the things in terms of fit with regards to the adhesive, now there's mm -hmm. different kind of glues and we'll talk about that in just mm -hmm. a little bit, but you want to have uh, an area when you're putting pieces together there's enough for glue, but not so much that the glue is more right. predominant. You, you don't want the again. you don't want the you don't want the glue to become the structure. Yeah. You want the glue to hold the structure together. So you need yeah. to leave just enough just enough gap in there to have a thin layer of adhesive so that it can grip both parts, but you don't want to be filling huge gaps with the adhesive yeah. because you're going to lose strength. Because you don't want to have the adhesive be the structure exactly. because there's no there's it, no there's no real structural rigidity to the adhesive. Exactly. Yeah. The, the the individual parts need to bear against each other to carry the load. Yeah. And the adhesive just holds them in place. So that's the trick too, is yep. when you're cutting and fitting, right. there's a little bit of a technique to get everything. Yep. Close. Yeah, you don't want to have, you know, but you don't want to get it too tight. When we're, yeah, when we're putting these parts in this jig, you don't want to have to drive them in there with a hammer because you've got them so tightly together. You want to be able to set them in there and they'll fit, but you don't want to see big. Pretty much any way I want to if I need to do that. And these are just a very inexpensive pair of kid scissors from yep. school. Yep. Um, uh, so scissors, mm -hmm. high tech. Yeah, very high <laughs> 99 tech. 99 cents. You yep, know? Very exactly. Uh, we have. A Mod saw. Modeler saw. Yeah. yeah, so this is a saw they use. It's called the Atlas Super Saw. And this is great because it's, it's easy to grip. Mm -hmm. It's designed for cutting train track. So if you're building a, a model, model train, railroad, yep. you're using this and it uh, lasts very long because it's designed to cut the, the metal, metal rails of the track. Right. So it works really nice for, uh, wood, for our wood, our yep. spruce, exactly. and it lasts forever. So yep. we have, this is a tiny saw, now yep. you can you, use a tiny hacksaw. You buy the, yeah, you buy that at your local hobby shop yeah. or, you know, or, or even a hardware store might right. have one. Exactly. Yep. And then we need something to hold it together. We talked about clamps, but there is a different way to kind of hold things together. It's like a clamp. It's like a pin, but it's basically a, a staple gun. That's right. Yep. So we use uh, basically quarter inch staples, mm -hmm. and those are a temporary way to hold the parts in place. Yep. So it might be a little hard to see, but we've got staples here, and these are holding things in place. They're not adding any kind of structure. No, there. actually, the, the adhesive gives you your structure. The, the staple is just the clamping force 
while the adhesive is setting. And to keep things from moving around. And, yeah, exactly. So you've got clamping force and you've got you know, holding things in place. Once the adhesive is set, if you wanted to, you could actually go back and remove all these staples before yeah. you varnish the rib. And that would be perfectly structurally fine. And the staples do not add any strength at all to the structure once the adhesive is set. Yeah. So if you wanted to, and some builders do, go back and very carefully pry all those out, save that little bit of weight because yeah. weight, weight is everything well, on sure. some of these smaller aircraft. Yeah. And then once you pull those out, then you varnish, the varnish seals the holes, and you're good to go. Yeah. I've seen, you know, in, talk, in terms of pulling the staples out, mm -hmm. I've seen people uh, take a twist tie and staple in, into the, the twist yep. tie underneath in the, the staple so they can just pull, pull the it staple out, yep. out instead of having to the gouge in there, yeah, with, something. In there with, yep. a, yep. with a, uh, yeah, with a yeah, with some kind of a knife like or that. something. Yeah, yep. exactly. Well, that's what the, so, I mean, so here a tiny saw, a staple gun, and scissors, of scissors, and then we have the adhesives, right. and the epoxy glue, and that's it. That really that that in the bare bones, that's all you really need. Yeah. Yep. So we've got some parts here. So let's let's build a rib. Yeah, let's do that. So we have our nose piece already cut. These yep. are actually parts that we use in our projects here at EAA. Yep. And it's a laser cut part out of plywood. Yep. And again, uh, in, the, in the current day and age, if, you're, if you get a wood aircraft kit, they might already have those cut out for More you, than possibly. Likely, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or again, you don't need a laser cutter to make this. You can get a sheet of plywood, make yourself a template, and just go down and draw them out and yep. on your bandsaw or whatever. You can cut these out, get your Dremel tool, and clean them up a little bit. Yeah. And you can make that part very simply. Yeah. Like like I said before in our previous segment, you know, our time's valuable, their time's is expensive, right. you know, and you can sit there and, yep. you know. It's, I mean, it's not that hard. No, it's not. So we, we place that in the jig and it just kind of snaps in. And Another thing I found, nice. if you want to duplicate parts like this, yeah. um, one of the ways I've done this, just as an aside, was um, just cut some square blocks that are kind of the size you want. Oh, okay. Stack them all together and then put them on your bandsaw and oh, you can yeah. cut like a half I've a dozen of these, that, yeah. a half a dozen of these out at once. And I use a, um, I actually make a template out of a, a thin sheet of aluminum and then I can just lay that template on top of this piece of wood, take it in my saw or my sander and, yeah. and use that template without worrying about making the thing too small or having to follow a line or whatever. Sure. I mean, there's some really handy little things you can do uh, that don't cost you anything but a little bit of time to make a, a, a pattern. And a small investment. And a material. very small investment. So yeah. the two words that I keep on hearing are bandsaw and uh, belt sander. Yep, that roughly for two hundred dollars, uh, about a hundred bucks a piece for the little yeah, table for a nice ones. One, yep. You have everything you need, and it will save you a tremendous amount of time right. and give you much more accurate work than doing it any other way. Right, and those tools are still in your shop when you finish your aircraft project for any home for repairing else. or whatever you want to do. I mean, they're handy tools to have anyway. Exactly. So certainly yeah. not something that you're going to buy once, use for the airplane, and then put on the shelf. It's yep. something you'll use again and again. Sure. So we have our nose piece in. That that's the easy part. That's the easy part. Yeah, we got. We're we're on our way. Now we need to get our uh, sticks. So let me get those out. Yeah. Whatever, and, you, whatever uh, you did with them. Yeah, I have them over here. I think. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we uh, will uh, get our our what we call our cap strips, which are the long pieces that form the top and the bottom of the the rib, the length of the rib, and then we'll uh, use that same material and we'll start cutting out our uh, uprights and our diagonals. So we kind of cheated here because we got the material already pre-cut. Some people will buy basically a, 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 a standard board and then use like a table saw to cut Right, you could actually shape. rip these uh, out of a board if you wanted to, or you can buy long lengths of this um, eighth inch square material from some of your aircraft supply places yeah. and then just cut whatever and lengths cut, you want. And that's what we've done here. Yeah, exactly. So uh, again, we want to look at our grain and make sure we're going to bend along the grain. And we just, now we're going to have to trim that off there. Yeah, so. so we take our little railroad saw. Yep. And I'll let you do the honors. All right, and we're just going to very carefully. And we're, we're keeping here. a pretty nice gap here, but there's a pretty nice, a, a relatively tight joint rather, just enough gap for the uh, adhesive to get in between things. Okay, I'm gonna take that out of that jig. Yeah, so here's another a cute, little, a cute little jig here, and we're gonna move this around so you can see it. So what this is, is just, I'm gonna show it at an okay. angle real quick. If you see there, we have a, a board, and then another piece of wood underneath, and that actually helps to hold it against the table. While we're so sawing. It's essentially, yep. the third hand. So instead yep. of moving it around all over the place, yep. it's holding it, and then we have it uh, at right angles and also at other angles. Yeah, so we can cut our so parts. So we can cut yeah. it, make it 
really, really quick, easy hit my spot cuts there. Yeah. There you go. Great. So, I mean, about Boom. six, about six swipes of the saw, and I'm and already boom, through it. Yep. So we can put that in place. And this is a custom fit part. I mean. Yeah, you'll make each one of these. Each one of these. In because the you'll have some variation in your, I mean, even if you've got a template, you're going to have some minor variations in your, your in gaps here. Fisher, yeah. And so you're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to have to check these and make sure that they're all, uh, uh, you know, hand fit, so to speak. So, so again, this one, I'm going to mark this one. That one's kind of a tight one because yeah. you have to do kind of an, a really yeah, yeah. acute angle. So I'm going to try to. Get, and, and this is one of them places where if I miss this cut just a little bit, I'm going to miss it a little long if I'm going to miss it at all. And that way I can take it on my sander and just touch it, or maybe just with a hand sander, yeah. to get the final fit that right. I you want. You don't want to so. go too short. Yeah. You can't put it back. No, it's, it's hard, to, hard to put them back together, which I don't know if I can do that in this thing or not, but we'll try it here. I don't think I got an angle that'll do this angle. But again, once you get it, once you get it started, it's not going to cut pretty quickly. There we go. Just that quick. Clean that up a little bit. Yeah. Whoops. Get her in both ends. Look at that. It's like it was meant to be. Perfect. And there's still, I mean, it's it's yeah. it's close. Yeah. But there's enough gap in there that we can. And th get this fluid. this joint right here is not the only thing holding this together. You've got this big gusset on each side, which exactly. is where the actual carries the yeah. load. So you do want a halfway decent fit. You don't want a great big gap there. But again, the gussets are helping carry those loads throughout these parts. So, yep. so yeah. the challenging ones are the diagonals, of course, because we have multiple angles. So I'll I'll try this one. So actually, what we want to do is. Yeah, do We're the upright do the first. Upright first. Yep, do so that. I'm going to start there, and then use our little fixture. Yep. And it's not quite straight. It's at a bit of an angle. I'm going to slide that over just a little bit here. Trying to follow my mark. These little saws work so oh, nice. Oh, those I are mean, just, uh, it's just slick as could be. Yeah. Yep. So we get that in. Let me flip that around. Yep, so get her so that you right. got the angle in the right direction there. Yeah. There she goes. There we go. Great. Now, Perfect. the tricky one here is this diagonal because we have yeah. one, two, three Yeah, put your upright three in there cuts. first so that you get. Yeah, we'll get that set. That looks yeah, pretty good. Beautiful, yeah, that's great. And then our diagonal. So this one's kind of weird because we have to kind of go two yeah, ways. Yeah, now here, if, if, you're, if you're looking at this here, you'll notice that it meets the upright a little bit and it meets the uh, cap strip a little bit. So it's actually going to be a little bit of a point if you really want to yeah. fit that in there properly. So this, you know, on this end where it's already cut off, this would be the perfect place to, have, you know, just touch it on your, your one inch belt, belt sander. sander. Yeah. And just, because it's just going to have to nib that off a little bit to yeah. get a perfect fit. Now for our purposes here, that, that fits good enough and frankly, that probably would carry enough load that this would be a perfectly safe rib. The being home builders were fussier than that, so we That's always right. like to make yeah. it fit absolutely perfectly. Uh, literally, when you take apart some of the really old vintage aircraft that were built in factories, I mean, they were building airplanes as fast really as they quickly. could. And they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't worry about that. fitting down yeah. to that level. I right. mean, a lot of that stuff had some pretty good gaps, yeah. but again, the gusset is carrying a lot of the load, so it's not just... That's a huge part of it, it because is. that gusset takes up a lot of area. Exactly. So, I mean, yep, that carries, little bit... Carries that load across the, all the parts. Well, just for time purposes, yep. we'll just kind of leave that one yep. like it is. Yep, exactly. You get one end and then you have to work on the other end and kind of get, a, again, the same kind of thing yep. where we're going to, I'm going to yep. do kind of that one line first. up two cuts. Yep, and exactly. Yep. What I'm doing is kind of uh, scoring the wood right where I think it's going to be. Right. So yep. I know where to cut and I'll put this back in and then I will cut it. Again, tiny little bits here. 
And this time, I, because of the small point, I'm not using a lot of pressure. No, you just just, just you let, let the saw do let the, the cutting. Saw just do the work. Work yeah. it back because it's soft wood. It's not difficult at all to cut. The so. other thing you want to do too is make sure you keep the saw perpendicular. You don't want to be cutting like this. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and put a bevel into yeah. it. So wow, look, look at that. that. Looks great. Yeah, you've done this before. Maybe once. <laughs> When I do wood, that, that just kind of a side note, I like to play like 1940s big band music. Yeah, it kind of you kind of get, it gets the you into that mood. Yep. <laughs> in fact, you can play in the mood if you yeah. wanted to. Yeah, there'd be so one. let's do one more, and then we'll talk about those gussets and how we put those together. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll let you do that one. All right. You didn't do any uprights yet, so it, right. it'll be your turn. I can handle that. Yeah. Let me just carefully see where I want that cut to be, and I'm going to score my wood so that I've got a mark, and I'll bring it out here. Put in my jig, so I can just basically just to hold it. Yeah. And we need a stronger bench, I think. A couple of swipes of the saw. Look at that, just yeah. as quick as that. Boom. And we want to go in this. Oops, I got the other go the other way. And angle there a little bit. There she goes. Boom. And we're there. Yeah. So we've started this, and we've got pretty much the first half done. Correct. There's some more diagonals and, and uprights of, that yep. we put in there. Right. Uh, but in the interest of saving some time, uh, we're going to leave this like it is now. Yep. And now we're going to talk about gussets in terms of how we put those on. So gussets, the size is predetermined. They're generally outlined in the plans. Correct. Yep. So you have a, a general idea. Mm -hmm. And you're cutting hundreds of these. Right. So we have a little jig here that's actually kind of preset for the size of the gusset where we can set this in place. Just hold it in there. And hold it in there and bring the scissors up to it. And we know exactly where to cut. Yep. So it saves a lot of time having to measure right. each one out. Exactly. So we can put that gusset. Yep, that one can go there or it could go here. It's, yeah, so we're going to use our. Yeah, that one could go up there. Up in the corner there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's this corner. Not Great. We'll just do another one here. Yep. This is uh, gusset number four. Okay, well, that's this guy down here. Now, which one did you do on the first one? Was that number two? I think it was number yeah, two. So yeah. two goes up here. So on the jig, actually, we have the numbers set. In terms right. Of what um, goes where. And just as an aside, uh, depending on how many of these you have, a lot of times you can make yourself a little numbered holder and you can cut a bunch of these out at once and okay, all these are number twos and all these are number fours. You Essentially put, a bin. Uh, yeah, but little little bins. And yeah. then that way you can you can spend a, lot of you time. spend a whole day making gussets instead of cutting gussets and make a rib and then cut gussets yeah. and make a rib. You can actually cut all your gussets out ahead of time and just have bins full of all the numbered gussets. Yeah. And then you just go right down and put your rib together. And because of the way wood is, this is something, you know, you can be sitting watching Football. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we get to do that again. Yep. And then be snipping gussets uh, all yeah, afternoon. Very simple. And then yeah. just put them into the bins yep. and away you go. So it isn't something you have to be out. Right. And it's like we talked about before. Every little bit of forward movement yeah. ends up in the big picture yep. of finishing it Getting off. that aircraft finished. Yep. yep. Even even to the point of gussets. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So yeah, and then you would make all your all your gussets, whichever numbers you need, uh, in all the different locations, and then once you get your Diagonals, your uprights, your cap strips, everything's in the jig. You get your gussets are all done, then you would go ahead and start your, your uh, adhesive and your, and your stapling. Yeah. Yep, so. so let's do that. Let's do that. We have the adhesives here. So we're using the T88 adhesive. Uh, it's an epoxy adhesive, so you want to protect yourself. You want right. to make sure you're wearing some physical or mechanical protection uh, so the epoxy doesn't get on your skin. So we have, uh, in this case, some nitro gloves. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and a lot of people don't think much about this. Um, if you're going to do it a little bit, people say, oh, that's not going to bother me. I don't have any problem with epoxy. Uh, but it's an accumulative thing. I know a lot of uh, guys that did a lot of aircraft work, restoration work in that, never bothered them for a while. And then all of a sudden, one day, they started breaking out because it's, it, it accumulated in their body. And yeah. finally, their body started reacting to yeah, it. Yeah, you so. can become sensitized to it. Exactly. And, and that's it. it yeah, you, well, can't, yeah, you can't get rid of it. Once, yeah, once, it right. starts, once it starts to bother you, you can't go the other way. So, so. when you're using epoxy for either wood, construction or composite construction, you have to be very, very careful to minimize any kind of contact exposure with it. Right. Now, one of the good things about the epoxies that we use today is that they have really 
made them more consumer friendly. Mm -hmm. Back in the day in the early 70s when we were building home-built aircraft, basically they were decanting industrial versions of right. epoxies. Right. They had a lot of nasty stuff in it. Over the years, they've removed some of those nasty chemicals right. and made them a little bit a little less. bit more, a little bit more friendly. Exactly. To, to the end user. Yeah, yeah but there's sure. still something yeah. you don't want to play around. Right. So. Right. Exactly. And when you're mixing the epoxy, like you know, we've got just a, a sheet of a paper here. You can use a paper plate. You can use anything that's not coated. You don't want anything like with a wax coating or anything on it. Bare paper, cardboard, whatever you've got, you can just go ahead and mix some right on there, and then you just throw it away when you're done. Yeah. You know? Exactly. And the and the key with the the wax is the wax can start dissolving the epoxy. Right. And then the epoxy doesn't stick. You don't you don't get the strength that you need. Exactly. Yep. So yep. you want to use unwaxed paper cups. Yep. Or a Plastic cups. Yep. Uh, or, or like I say, just a, a flat sheet of paper on yeah. un, an unwaxed paper plate. Yep. Or a, if it's plastic coated, not a problem. Yep. Or, or not yep. coated like these cups, right. you're okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. So the T88 adhesive, uh, it's an A and B part. Yep. It's a one to one mix. Right. So it's one part of A to one part of B. I just did a recent uh, hints for home builders on how to really fine tune uh, uh, mixing the, yeah. the uh, proportions, but. For general purposes, you can eyeball it. Exactly, and that's why I like to use, my, personally, I like to use a flat sheet because I'll literally draw a line of A and draw a line right next to it of B, same length line, mix them together, you yeah. pretty much want 50 50. You so know? show me how that works because I yeah. don't, I, I usually do a cup. Yeah. So I want to. I mean, like well, if you're going to, if you're going to need a lot, if you're going to need, if you're going to do a lot of ribs fairly quickly, then a cup is better because you'll get, you'll have more material to work with. I just want to move this out of the if way. If you're just so going to get a couple of them. You can get a closer shot of yeah. this. If you're just going to, if you're just going to do a couple of them, you can take your, your part A here. Let me get some down into the, into the uh, spigot there. Yeah. And I can just draw a line. Like that. Okay. And then I'll take my part B right next to it and get some of that down in the spigot. And by the way, we, uh, we like to use disposable things. You don't want to use stuff that you have to reuse or clean because that takes time. Yep. And there you time go. So, so I basically have a equal, two equal strips of, uh, of a part A and a part B there. I take my popsicle stick That's it. or whatever kind of mixer you want to use and I just literally just stir them together. It's just as simple as that. It's really easy. There's nothing to this at all. Just get them good and mixed so that you've got a nice even color. You don't see any clear. You don't see any amber. Uh, you just want a nice kind of a milky. And that's what's nice about the T88 is yeah. because it is two different colors. Yeah, you can, it's easy to mix that you together. You can tell when you got see it, it. It went from a dark amber and a com completely clear. Now we've got a nice even kind of a light milky color there. Right. And now we know that we've got a good, good mixture. Keep her stirred up there. And then we're we're basically ready to go. You can use this to apply it if you want. Or yeah. You can use a little brush, whatever. Yeah. So what we also use, you know, besides the popsicle stick yep. to apply it, you can use. Uh, they call these acid brushes. Correct. Yep. But uh, they're just a very durable brush. Right. Yeah. They're small. You don't have a big. Yeah. It's not like a paint brush. It's not like a paint brush. Yeah. yeah. So you can get into small corners yep. and things. Again. One use only. You use it and throw it away. Yep. I mean, yep. Yeah. Exactly. It's 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 not exactly environmentally friendly, but. It's yeah, you, you can't. You really once you get this epoxy in that brush, you can't wash it out. Yeah, you really it's not, can't. It's not going anywhere. No, it is, so. and you don't want to because then you have to use solvents, and that becomes yep. even a worse yep. nightmare. So if I was going to put this rib together in this joint right here, I would take these parts back out. I'd put a little bit of epoxy on the, each end. Now we would have sanded these. Two. Yeah, yeah, we would have. Of course, the ends here are already porous. We wouldn't right, have to sand course, those. Yeah. But I would have sanded the ends of my. And scuff uh, them up. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. scuff them up a little bit. And uh, then I'll just put that in there with my epoxy on it. If I can get it in there, I took it out so it should fit. There it goes. And then I do the same thing on my, on my, I want to make sure I put that in there the right way. Put, right. Put a little bit on each end, a little bit on the ends here. Just a, not much, just a, a nice thin, thin layer. Drop that in my jig there. So that's ready. And I would do that all the way back. Sure. And then I'd take my, my gusset, and I know my gusset's going to go on there just like this. Uh, what some builders actually do is they take a pencil and draw a line on the rib to show where that gusset's going to be. So when they put their epoxy uh, on it, it's just on. That it's spot. on there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so I'm I'm just going to kind of guesstimate it here, and I'm going to rub some epoxy on where I know that the gusset's going to be. And again, you don't want. 
a you, lot. Yeah, you just, don't want just a nice coating on not there. Not a thin coating either because there is some epoxy yeah. that's absorbed into the wood. Now, here's an interesting point, and a lot of uh, a lot of builders, uh, earlier builders, never thought of this, but um, the inside of this gusset is still bare wood. Yeah. Now. If you were going to varnish this rib, you'd have to try to get down in there and varnish the inside it's of that. Impossible. It, well, it's not impossible, well, but it's but, a pain in the butt. So yeah. what I just do is I coat the whole inside of the thing, even the part that's not going to contact the rib. Exactly. I'm going to coat the whole inside of that with my epoxy, and that's going to seal my gusset on the inside, and I won't have to worry about that being sealed up later when I varnish the rib. Perfect. So I'm going to cover that whole thing that's with epoxy. Tip, yep. Yeah. Cover that hole, just a nice, not, doesn't have to be a heavy layer, just a nice yeah. thin layer. We'll a lot of people off. will, you know, mark it yep. off and just yep. put that amount on. Yep. But yep, but then I can just go ahead and I can set that on there, line it up with my edges like I want. And then I can take my stapler, and you want to make sure that our staple is right in the center of the rib there, which I kind of missed on that one, so i got to be a little bit more careful on this one. Now the next step up from this spring-loaded hand mechanism is a pneumatic stapler. Some people will use upholstery staplers because the stapler is a little smaller, yep. and and even electric staplers yep. because then you don't have all this physical force as yep. you're holding. The other the other way to do this, which is a little bit more time-consuming, um, is to use the really little. Uh, actual nails that are made for this, which sure. are very, very incredibly small little yeah, coated, hold them with they're coated nails, and uh, um, you can actually use, uh, you get a little tack hammer that's magnetic, oh, yeah. and you can actually pick the nail up with the magnetic hammer and just tap it in the spot, and then one whack and it drives it home. Holstery hammer, those yep. little yep. kind of... Uh, yep, exactly, really long, skinny, yeah. yep, exactly. Yep. And that's really all there is to it. Now those staples are, are applying your clamping pressure. Yep. So it's it's getting a proper clamping on there to get that uh, uh, adhesive to to bond. Yep. And it's also keeping that part from being Moving bumped around, around yeah. while the adhesive is setting. Yeah. And then again, once that adhesive is set, we could pull them staples out if we wanted. Right. And and. The process on this is to continue. We'd put the gusset plates in yep. every single joint. Yep. Right. And then what we're going to do is once that's this side is done, we have to carefully remove it Lift from the fixture. It, which is why you want to make sure your fixture isn't going to bond with that adhesive. Exactly. That's why you cut, coat your fixture with linseed oil or, yeah. or car wax or something like that. So we're basically going to take it off and then we have to flip it over and because the gusset plates have to be on the other side. Right. Well. Now, but now you don't have to worry about holding everything else in place because the, the gussets that are on your first side hold everything in place. You can just yeah. lay it on your bench now and go ahead and put your gussets on the opposite sure. side. Sure. So you, what, what a lot of builders will do is they'll They'll get one going, uh, say in the morning before they go to work, they'll put yeah. a, a rib in the jig, put all your gussets on, they come home for lunch, they'll pop that one out, flip it over, put those gussets on, put another one in the jig at lunch, and then they come back at home at night, and they can pop that one out, and, and of course they can spend some more time in the evening making some more if they want, sure. but literally in just a few minutes you can build three ribs a day just, just by doing it that way, right. and morning, they, noon, and evening. And that know? just adds up after yep, a while, exactly. absolutely. So, so lots of different ways to do it. Yeah, I mean everyone has their kind of the they'll process. The yeah. process they'll get through right. fast, slow, or in between. Yeah. Doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're going to have a quality part that you can use on your airplane. Yep, exactly. So That's once exactly. we have this done, we've removed the staples, and we talked about protecting it. Right. So we're going to protect it with some sort of coating. A varnish of some kind, a, you know, a marine varnish of some type, uh, or an epoxy varnish nowadays. A lot of people are using epoxy varnishes as well. So again, epoxy implies two parts. So it's yep. a, you mix an A part and a B right. part. It's yep. just a liquid paint, essentially. Exactly, very a very thin, thin version of this yeah. right here. Same, sure. same chemical process, just a different viscosity. But very. But or, or you can go back to your old marine varnish, which are a true varnish product, and you can use those as well. And that's yeah. what was used on the the travel air that we just took apart that was done in 1929. Yeah. And we can still see the original build marks underneath it. It yep. was perfect condition. So if it's done properly, yeah. it'll last a long, long time. Right. So one of the things you have to watch out for in terms of when you're coating that uh, depending on the uh, covering system you're using if it's a solvent based covering system you want to make sure that the solvent is going to not going to attack whatever coating you exactly. have yep. so that's why a lot of people do go to the two part epoxy right yeah and, it isn't attack and and, and most of your covering systems whether it's polyfiber or Stuart's or whatever they'll they'll recommend what type of coatings they Under, want underneath, underneath there yeah, so before, so you'll be able to get some direction on that right from your covering process yeah because before. you don't want your coating system to mess up your yeah, underlying exactly. covering 
uh, that are is essentially encapsulating and protecting and preserving the, the wood, wood for right. such a long period of time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then uh, those are the main steps. That's basically it. Well, if, if you, to put if you can do if you can do this, you can build an entire airplane out of wood because literally it's just various different sizes and shapes of that same process right there. And we talk about this a lot, but it, it is truly that. This is not hard stuff. No, it's very simple, very basic. Lots of little steps like this add up to yep, something. Yeah, adds very, up to it. And, and, and again, it didn't take us that long just to do this. No. So, I mean, this is not something that's going to take a long, long time for you. You're going to be able to put these parts together in, in a relative reasonable amount of time. It's yeah. not going to be bad at all. So we talked about some of the resources that are available to you in terms of building wood airplane. One is AC4313. Yep. You can either buy it as the book yep. or download it from the FAA website. Of course, EA Hints for Home Builders. So we have a lot videos, of good yep. hints on how to do this, yep. but also connecting with an EA chapter and in your area, an EA technical counselor right. that can oversee your work. And there are counselors that are uh, specialists or have had a lot of experience yep. in wood, wood, ex yep. wood construction and sheet metal construction. Composite, whatever it yeah, might be. Exactly. Yeah. And as you go further, once you have your airplane constructed, and are ready to go into the, the flight test phase, we have the EA flight advisors. Just a host of, of lots of great reference and good background information. Right. Uh, and, and of course our EA and, books and videos yep, too. And, and just your local chapter, there's lots of people that are in the chapters. They might be A&P mechanics or experienced builders. And of course they're all there to help. That's what the chapter well, is that's all it. about. You know, yeah. it's part of the camaraderie, getting together with yep. people. Part of the EA family. Yeah, as compared to watching or just reading or right. doing something like that. Exactly. It makes a huge difference when you, huge difference. you know, like we're doing here, just talking and just we're uncovering questions and answering questions exactly. uh, that we didn't even think about. Exactly. Exactly. And that, yep. that's a big part of it. I think that's it. I we, think we should we, build a wood airplane. I think we should build a wood airplane. There's a lots of really cool designs out there in the wood air, airplane field, so don't discount it. If you're thinking about building an aircraft, this can be a really economical and a fun way to build an airplane and get a, a really nice performing airplane when you're finished. And it's a lot of fun. And too. it's a lot of fun, yeah. Thanks for watching this hour's a workshop video here at uh, EA Together and the Spirit of Aviation Week. My name is Mark Forrest, along with... I'm Joe Norris. We'll be back tomorrow with another series of workshops. Check the schedule for what's coming up throughout the week. We're doing this twice a day live here from EA Oshkosh. Thanks, everyone. Take care. The average age of the B-17 pilot was 21. I was just barely 22. It was a young man's war.